So the nervous system is going to be a department of various tasks, various responsibilities to our body, to our senses, to all the things that we enjoy when we're able to walk around, when we're able to eat, when we're able to smell, when we're able to think, when we're able to, to feel love and be loved. We, there's all different kinds of senses. Now, when you compare the nervous system to all the other body systems, have you noticed one thing in particular in common? That the nervous system is really going to play a really, really major role in all the other systems as well. Now, we might just be talking about the eye and the ear in special senses. We might just be talking about, you know, the skin. We might just be talking about some simple things within other, the other body systems, but if not for the nervous system, then the other body systems are not going to be able to function as they would like to because it doesn't have all of the, all of the tools to do what it needs to do if the nervous system is not working. So it's important that we have a good understanding of the structure and the function of a synapse. In other words, we're going to find out there's something called a synaptic response. And in that synaptic response, we're going to be sending and transmitting neurons and axons you know, to the brain for interpretation so that we can get those impressions and make the body go through the movements that it needs to go through. We'll find out that in the nervous system there's something called the blood-brain barrier. Now, sometimes that's, that's hard to say, you know, the, the blood-brain barrier. But what that's basically designed for is to keep infections out of the brain. So, in other words, it's, it's, a, it's what the name implies. It's a barrier, you know, that's going to keep infections and toxins and things. Or let me put it this way, try to keep those things from entering into the nervous system or maybe into the brain. You might have heard of something called meningitis, itis, suffix, inflammation of, the meninges, you know, in the brain that could swell and cause an infection all to itself. So we're going to find out how important that is because the blood-brain barrier is responsible for that. It works a lot like the lymphatic system that we've talked about where it's designed, you know, to attack all of those pathogens and antigens and bacteriums and viruses and all this kind of stuff, you know, that would invade our body to try to make us sick describing the structure of the functions of the meninges. So in other words, it's important that, that we understand that the, if the meninges become infected, then we are going to get the meningitis. We're going to get that inflammation or maybe that disease. The structure and the functions of the spinal cord. I could go on for hours about that, but I won't. But, I mean, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have pity on you guys, and I won't <laughs> talk that long about it. But the spinal cord you will find out how important that is and how the spinal cord breaks down into different sections that are responsible for that, those synaptic responses and activity of the firings of the neurons and the axons to make our body move, to make it do certain things, even involuntary movements or voluntary movements, things that we consciously do or even unconsciously do. How important the spinal cord is going to be that can affect them as well. We'll find out that the cerebral spinal fluid is a very important fluid as well because if uh, when you get uh, in clinic you know when you work around certain kinds of patients and you might have to find out well we wonder if maybe there's blood in the spinal column you know from an accident or if there's some kind of disease you know that we can't just do a blood panel test and find out if there's something wrong we might have to take a, a tap of the spinal cord to get some cerebral spinal fluid to find out what kind of fluid is being floated up and down that, that, that nervous system that might be coming from the brain and, and, and would the brain be affected by it. We'll find out how important the spinal column is when it comes to reflexes. Have you ever gone to the doctor, you know, and you're sitting on the side of the table and he's asking, you, oh, how's school and how's college and, you know, how's the nursing program going and all this kind of stuff. And then all the while, they're taking a little plastic mallet, you know, and then tapping it onto the end of your knee to try to get some kind of response or maybe a reflex, you know, to see if, all, if, if everything's firing, if all the spark plugs, figuratively speaking, in your brain are working, you know, then we'll see if all those synaptic responses are occurring like they should. So we will do certain kinds of testings like this to find out if things are working as they should. We, we have the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. We've, there are differences between them, and all those differences are going to make a big play into the causes and the signs and the symptoms and the treatments of various diseases and disorders of and what happens, what we're talking about today is the nervous system and how all that plays a big part. Now, if we, if we just want to really keep it easy and keep it simple, we want to just drive the, take a, 
you know, take a, a marker and mark it down one half of the entire system, we could actually break it down into two major parts. And that would be the CNS, which is the acronym for Central Nervous System, or the PNS, which stands for the Peripheral Nervous System. They're both highly complex, but we'll find out, and we can keep it fairly simple when we describe the two. But it's important that we do know that the two major parts of the nervous system are going to be the CNS and the PNS, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Because they, and then there's the control, because they have the controls over all the organ systems, and it's important for maintaining balance within those systems so that everything continues to run like a well-oiled machine. If you, if you ever, have you ever dealt with a patient that maybe would present with something along the lines of a nervous system disorder of some kind. It's really going to be hard to diagnose it and especially hard to treat, but that's why our doctors have taken the time out of their life to do, to make, to do the studies and the practices that they've done you know, to try to perfect this for us. But they're so hard to diagnose and treat because there's so many of them. There's so many things that can be wrong in terms of disorders, and, there's, and they're so too numerous for us when we're rooming patients and we're having to understand, well, why are we seeing them today? Well, they can give us all the signs and the symptoms that they're going through, but, but the diagnoses that we leave up to our physician, that, that, that makes her job or his job just a little bit harder. But when you're talking about the central nervous system, when you're talking about the peripheral nervous system, you're, you're, you're dividing it down between the two, like we talked about just a couple moments ago about the central nervous system. I want you to think of it like this. When you're thinking the central nervous system, you're thinking basically just the brain and the spinal cord. Visualize in your mind's eye just the image of, of the brain and then like a spinal cord dangling down from it. That's what you're talking about when you're talking about the central nervous system. Whereas the peripheral nervous system, the peripheral nerves, they can actually be broken down into a couple more categories called the somatic, and here comes some more acronyms at you, the SNS, or somatic nervous system, which is basically those skeletal voluntary muscles, and the autonomic nervous system, or ANS, which take care of all those automatic functions that we enjoy. But then, remember the neurons are the star of the show. Without the neurons working like they should, our body is not going to be in homeostasis and work like it should in a natural way. But so that means that we've got to make sure that we understand and there are, that there are three major types of neurons. One being the afferent, which are basically the sensory information that we get from if we're outside walking around or inside a building that's too hot or too cold. Like I know in this particular room right now, it could be a little cooler. <laughs> you know, so, we, so, so my afferent nerves are active right now thinking, oh my, we wish we could you know, you know, make it a little cooler in here. And so the environment or inside for, and it's sent to that central nervous system for interpretation. So in other words, even though I'm feeling like, man, it could sure be a little cooler in here, then it's activating my central nervous system and my, my interpretation of that is, yes, we need to make it cooler. Then there's the efferent or motor nerves that are impulses from that central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system, the other part of the body, remember, other than, than the brain and the spinal cord, to allow for movement, you know, like the, skeletal, the muscular skeletal system, to en enable us to be able to walk around, for, for, for me to be able to take a step from here over to here. And then we have the interneurons, where, which are the interpretive neurons, between that efferent and that efferent nerves of the central nervous system. So we even have that middle ground between them as well. Now, when you have, when those neurons fire and when they have activity, they actually transmit an electrochemical message but we know them as nerve impulses. Nerve impulses are really basically a, a, a reaction between, those, the, between the chemicals and the nerves to produce that, that effect. So it transmits electrochemical messages called, called nerve impulses, and they send them to other neurons or other muscles or glands to create the activity that the body needs to perform to be able to do what it does. We can actually break down a neuron structure. We can actually break it down into dendrites and swan cells and axons. And those axons are really are what kind of care. You have the, the major neuron, which is basically a cell, and then we have axons that are going to carry that impulse outward. And the distance by which it carries it outward will differ. 
but those parts make up that neuron structure. We've got then we've got the white matter, you know, which are portions of the brain, you know, that's going to you know to help understand and, and be responsible for some of that interpretation. We've got the Schwann cells that wrap around those axons, you know, that and there's something called myelin. You know, there's, there's a myelin that, that insulates those axons. It's kind of like putting a, a coating over, it's kind of, well, think of it like this, like your coaxial cable where you might get your, get your satellite feeds from or, inter, or internet feeds. You know, you have the cable and then you've got like a protective covering on the outside of it. Think of that like as a myelin. And then we have something called the gray matter, which are axons without the myelin sheath that's there to protect it. We talk about neurotransmitters being the all-important thing because without those neurons being able to transmit those electrochemical messages that we need to be able for the body to be able to function, then we need to make sure that we understand the functions of those neurotransmitters. That they can cause muscles to contract or relax. They can cause glands to secrete products. In other words, when I'm when I'm thinking about that Charlie's chicken today, <laughs> here I go. When I'm thinking about that chicken, I can, I can start salivating already. Well, by that salivating, I'm activating actually a, 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 a glandular secretion because my digestive system is thinking, oh, no, there he goes again. He's thinking about going over there and eating some chicken again today. You know, so, and so it's activating the salivary glands. But it's not just the salivary glands, folks. It's all, it's all the other glandular secretions and productions in our body you know, that we talk about when we talk about, like, for example, the endocrine system where we have all these natural secretions, whether it's the digestive system, you know, where it's in the respiratory system, where I don't care which of the, of the systems we're talking about, we've got those secretions going on, if it weren't for, and if it weren't for the neurotransmitters to be able to cause muscles to contract, for, to cause glands to secrete products, to either activate or inhibit neurons. So in other words, our, we don't want our body to go crazy, so our, our neurotransmitters also have a safety gauge in them to keep us from, from going crazy. In other words, in other words, where our neurons just don't start firing, you know, rapidly, you know, it, you know without reason. And, and of course, uh, on, a, on a sadder note, you know, unfortunately for many of our patients that might have seizures, you know, this is what the cause is. In other words, we've got those neurotransmitters that are just going berserk and they're just firing every which way. And it's, it's, and it's, attack, and it's, it's, it's touching, it's sending those electrochemical messages to the muscular skeletal system, causing muscles, you know, to twitch and, and then arms. I mean, it's, it's hard and for convulsions. So we have a lot of, uh, there are many reasons why our patients might present having those particular problems because of, of maybe neurotransmitting problems within the central nervous system. We talked about the fact that within that ser uh, central nervous system, that basically includes the brain and the spinal cord. That blood-brain barrier becomes very important for us because it's what protects the layers of the membranes of that central nervous system. You have a bunch of tight capillaries, you know, that are sticking together, you know, to to create that protection to prevent unwanted stuff from from getting into the tissues of the brain or the spinal cord. Because then you've got that inflammation, like we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture, that then that inflammation can make that tissue more permeable. Now, real quickly, when that, when that means permeable, that means that once that inflammation is there and it starts becoming inflamed, permeable means stuff, other stuff can get through it. In other words, it turns it into something like a, like a sponge, where a sponge is not completely solid. It opens up and stuff can get through it, can permeate through it, and that's what it's talking about here. So that becomes important. And, of course, we touched on a little bit earlier the fact about the meninges, you know, how if something could infect it or permeate in through it, then our patient's going to be presenting with all kinds of problems. Now, I mentioned the fact that the spinal cord, and this is what's really important for us, I mentioned the fact that the spinal cord is going to be responsible for certain activities within that neuromuscular condition that we have to be able to walk around, to be able to speak, you know, to be able to eat, you know, to be able to look and see and appreciate a red rose. You know, our senses. There's, there's a lot of things that's going to be affected if, with, if the spinal cord has, if there's, if there's a problem within one of the regions of it, and it's these regions that are really important for us, especially if you're in clinic, and, you're, and in your clinic you work with certain kinds of x-rays or certain kinds of, of radiological views, you know, that, that are going to be present, and you might have some of these x-rays in your office, you want to make sure that you know what these regions are 
And now in your textbook, I know that within your textbook you're going to have a listing of these. So the good news is you don't have to write all these down because that's how important they are because I know they're in your book. So you really need to know that we have 31 spinal segments, different sections. We have the cervical. We have the thoracic. We have the lumbar. We have the, the sacral. We have the coccygeal. And that's basically the tailbone. That's why there's only one of them. And I'm glad we only got one. And that, even the one can cause so much pain. You're going to have some, uh, many patients coming into clinic. They're going to have all kinds of problems. Did you know you could break your, your coccyx, you know, and with just a, just a, maybe just barely, uh, just a little bit of amount of a touch and it can break it. And that sucker can cause you pain. And just, just ask anybody that you know that might have, had, have broken it, maybe from a little fall. And you don't even have to fall and have an accident to break it. It's much like the clavicle. It only takes, no, it only takes like three pounds of pressure to break your clavicle. You know, a lot of martial artists know that, you know, because there's certain, there's certain kind of punches that you can make where you can actually, you know, break that just real easily to be able to pr protect yourself against an attacker. So, you know, there's certain target points you know you can go after, you know, to protect yourself. So anyway, so eight cervical segments. So the next time you go, you talk with a physician, and, and they go, well, I was looking at your x-ray. I was looking at your left frontal view, and it looks like you've got a C7. A C7 that's out of whack, or a C7 that's being pinched, you know, because you know what I mean by pinching. Did you know that you're within that spinal column? You've got all kinds of nerves and fibers and 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 blood and all. There's all kinds. It's vascular and there's nerves and it's all intertwines within that column. It all intertwines and it, you you can actually pinch that. And if it gets pinched, that means it's not going to get in the the blood circulation or the oxygen, you know, and all the nutrition that it needs. And something that is related to that particular segment is going to be affected, whether it's the kidneys, whether it's the brain, whether it's your upper or lower back, you know, whether, whether it's your sinuses. A lot of folks don't know that. But my point is there's a lot of things that can affect you medically just from a problem with one of the spinal segments, one of the 31 spinal segments within your spinal column, not to mention any kind of infections or anything that might be going on down there too. So you need to know you've got eight cervical. You need to know you've got 12 thoracic. You need to know you've got five lumbar. You need to know you've got five sacral. And thank goodness only the one tail, <laughs> one coccygeal. So that's important for us. Now, one of the functions of the spinal cord is to carry sensory information to and from the brain. I think it's kind of like that Geico commercial on TV. Well, everybody knows that because that's true because it's just it's to carry all that information. So you can already see that if there's a problem within that delivery, within those, those chemo, uh, chemical receptors and the sensory you know, output, if there's, if there's problems within that, then it's going to be affecting what information our brain actually gets. So we have within that spinal cord in the transmission, it's kind of like us sending an email or we're sending a text to somebody, only in the spinal cord it would be like they're called ascending tracks or descending tracks, where those ascending tracks are going to carry sensory information up to the brain, and then the descending, just as the name implies, are going to take it downward away from the brain. So the descending that, that carry that motor information down from the brain to all those muscles and the glands to get them to do the things that they're supposed to be doing. Now here's one of the final things I'll touch on, is we've got four sections of the brain. We've got the cerebellum, the diencephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. I mean, the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. All these are major important parts of the brain. Now, I know that you're going to find this within your resources as well to make sure that you're able to identify each of these four because these, each of these are going to have a particular play as well. So make sure that you look for your page in your book that has these on there because that's going to be important for you. In that cerebrum, we've got different lobes. We've got the frontal lobe that's going to be responsible for a lot of voluntary body movements. We've got the parietal, which is, are some of the sensory you know, type uh, sensations that are going to interpret the sensations for the body. We've got the temporal lobe, which is responsible for the auditory. It's going to interpret sound. And then we have the occipital, what we see. So in other words, when we, when we take a rose and we actually look at it, it's going through that vision that's going through my eyes, you know, and then I'm going, my brain's going to interpret what I see. Uh, I can smell inside this beautiful red rose and smell what it's like, it's like and it gives me a nice sensory re a response as well. And I'm able to enjoy that because of all of these different parts of my brain working. Now, some, some people would argue that not all my parts of my brain are working right, but 
but so far it seems to be they are today. So anyway, so keep this in mind that we've got all these wonderful lobes, and then we've got the cortex, which is that outer layer of gray matter, that are, and that's about 75% of all the neurons, so that's the biggest party in the building going on there, in which in that cortex it's to interpret that sensory information. It, it initiates that body movement when I want to take a step from here and go over to here. It stores memories and creates emotions. It, can you imagine how void you and I would be you know, if, if we didn't have that part of our brain working as it should? Unfortunately, uh, diseases like Alzheimer's, certain kinds of accidents and diseases will affect that area. And we start losing some of those memories. If, you ever, if you've ever talked with maybe a patient that, uh, in the Alzheimer's ward where you know, say, well, they might remember what they did 73 years ago or 60 years ago, but they couldn't remember what, what kind of pureed food they had breakfast. You know, that's what's really sad, especially for all of you, you know, working in the assisted living. You know, that becomes really sad, but that's one of the areas of, of the brain that, that can become affected as well, you know, by those diseases and disorders. So we have those important parts. We have the, the endiencephalon, you know, that between that set, the cerebral hemisphere split right down to the center of the brain. It's, it's, right, it's right above the brain stem, which is the thalamus, which is that that to relay station, if as it were, for, a, for sensory information going to the brain for that interpretation that we talked about at the very beginning of the hour. And then the hypothalamus maintains homeostasis by regulating vital activities. Probably one of the most vital is your breathing. And if you've heard one of the other lecturers, uh, lectures where we've talked about a lot of times there's, you know, athletes have problems, on, or have accidents on the field, and, the, and what they first, one of the first things they do is they run out to the field with a cervical collar, and put it around their neck because of the fact that if, there's, if, if one of those C vertebrae, like we talked about in the spinal column, if one of those C sections are broken or, or diseased or accidentally you know, cracked or fractured, then that could actually stop them from breathing, breathing being controlled by the hypothalamus you know, that helps keep, keep our body system going. So it's really important that we know about all those different kinds of those of, of all the sensory receptors, about all the different things that it does and how, and how important that becomes to us when we're talking the nervous system. Uh, so that's basically just kind of an overview, overview. That's just like a big picture overview of the nervous system. And when we get back together again, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it in more detail. But, but for today, that's basically an introduction you know, to the nervous system and all the wonderful things it does. And in many cases, what you'll see in clinic, maybe some of the things that it, that's not doing you know, like it should. And that's our overview for today. This is Doug Mack.